So Brendan Nyhan is a professor in the Department of Government at Dartmouth College. His research focuses on misperceptions about politics and healthcare. Before coming to Dartmouth, he was a Robert Wood Johnson Scholar in Health Policy Research at the University of Michigan. He is a contributor to The Upshot at New York Times and co-author of All the President's Spin, a New York Times bestseller. So please welcome Brendan Nyhan. All right. Uh, thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the invitation from JFN. And what I'd like to do is uh, share with you some of the, the, the findings from my research and hopefully help stimulate some conversations and thinking among all of you in how you might address the kinds of problems that I study in my research. What I'm going to tell you about is, is this difficult challenge that we're thinking about in the United States where I live and of course all around the world, including here in Israel, and that's how to challenge false beliefs. When people believe things about the world that are true or unsupported by the best available evidence, what can we do about that? How can we best address those kinds of misperceptions? Where do they even come from in the first place? That's what I'd like to talk to you about today and to share with you a, a lot of research I've been doing um, over the last decade or so to try to better understand these questions. Okay? So what I want to tell you about today, are, are I want to help you think about why these problems might be a little more complicated than you might think. And we're going to break down the problem of why people believe things that are false or unsupported by the best available evidence into two components. The first is what we call selective exposure, this idea that we tend to prefer information that reinforces or coincides with our own worldview, identity, or predispositions. And then this problem of selective acceptance, that even when we're exposed to information that might seem to contradict things we'd like to believe, we are sometimes inclined to reject them when they don't coincide with our worldview or what we'd like to be true. Okay? So I'm going to talk about both of those problems, and then I'm going to share with you some recommendations for best practice based on the research we've done so far, and finally uh, conclude by talking a little bit about how funders and others can help contribute to building the evidence base in this area, which is something um, that all of you have the opportunity to do in your own giving if you insist on scientific rigor in evaluating the effectiveness of your grantees' uh, work. So the problem, again, is, is why do people believe things that are false or unsupported by the best available evidence? And what you can see here on the screens are two of the most prominent examples of this in the United States, which is the context I know best. I'm a scholar of American politics. Um, there's a sign referring to the uh, infamous death panel myth that was uh, a very salient claim during the debate over the Affordable Care Act, President Obama's health care legislation that was being debated in 2009 and 2010. Sarah Palin, the former vice presidential candidate, coined the term death panel, and many people came to believe that under Obama's health care plan, you would be forced to go before a government board which would decide whether you would receive life-saving health care or not. Now, that was not true. That was not in the bill. But it had a very significant influence on the debate over the bill. And for years afterward, uh, end-of-life care in the United States was shaped by this myth that had been created out of whole cloth. On the right, we have a sign referring to the false belief that vaccines poison children. Okay, so this is something that extends beyond health to other kinds of issues that people have strong and passionate beliefs about. Vaccines are unfortunately one of those, even though they are uh, one of the great public health achievements of the 20th century and have saved millions of lives. There are still widespread myths and misconceptions about their safety and efficacy that plague people working in public health in the United States, Europe, and all around the world. So, what do we do when people have these kinds of beliefs? Well, we'd like to think that all we need to do is bring the correct facts to them. People believe these, believe these things that aren't true, and we're just simply going to tell them, here are the facts that you would need to know. Right? Here's why what you think is false. Right? And that's a, that's a world, of course, I'd love to live in, and you'd love to live in it too. Um, but it's not actually the world that we live in. Um, it, this is sometimes called the deficit communication model in science communication, this idea that people simply lack information, and all we have to do is give it to them, and they'll update their beliefs and change their behavior in the way we might hope. And, that's a, you know, and then when you think about it that way, you can see why this might be challenging when it comes to issues that people have strong, passionate ideas about that relate to their worldview or identity. Okay? Um, the real reaction that we often encounter when we uh, are trying to communicate about these misconceptions looks more like this. Right? On the one hand, this is my stylized model of the American voter. Okay? So on the one hand, we have a lot of people who aren't paying very close attention. They're hard to reach. It's hard to get that correct information to them. 
that they might need or that you might think they need at least. Right? And for those folks who you do reach, they often react more like the, the gentleman in the bottom uh, panel there. Right? Simply that when we encounter information that seems to contradict what we'd like to be true about the world, we're often unduly skeptical of that information. And psychologists call this disconfirmation bias. And it's a very powerful force in human psychology. We're all more skeptical of things that seem to contradict what we already believe or call aspects of our worldview or identity into question. That's a normal sort of human reaction, of course. We all do that. The fact that you're here means you're, on average, a more educated and knowledgeable group than the general public, which means you're actually probably better at resisting things you'd like not to believe than the average person. You can marshal more facts, information, and counter-arguments to try to defend those beliefs you'd like to hold. Okay? So that can make it very challenging. Now, it's totally understandable, of course, that you wouldn't want to necessarily change your opinions based on one piece of new information. But this becomes more problematic when it comes to the realm of facts. Okay? In some cases, people aren't simply unwilling to update their opinions about the world, but they may be unwilling to update their factual beliefs about the world. And that's how these myths, myths and misconceptions can be so resistant to change, why it can be so difficult to change people's minds when they hold false or unsupported beliefs. So, the misperceptions that are out there, I just want to give you a sense of how prevalent they are. These are two of the most widely believed misconceptions about the, mo the, the two previous United States presidents before Trump, um, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Okay, these are polls taken in the United States from nationally representative samples looking at how prevalent belief in these myths were at their peak during those two presidencies. And you can see that um, millions and millions and millions of Americans believed in the so-called birther myth that Barack Obama wasn't born in this country, or the 9-11 truther myth that the Bush administration aided or allowed the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Okay. So these are not fringe beliefs. These are not things believed by a, a tiny percentage of people. These are actually very common misconceptions. And you can see how closely they track with people's partisanship. Right? Again, remember, people's identity and worldview is going to be often most important in what they believe to be true. And so you can see that Republicans were much more likely to believe in the birther myth um, because that reflected negatively on Barack Obama, who most of them didn't like. Conversely, for Democrats, who are more likely to believe in the 9-11 truther myth about George W. Bush, a president who wasn't from their party. These kinds of misperceptions exist around the world, though. I, I don't, I, my, most of my examples will be US-specific because that's my expertise, but I'm increasingly doing research around the world. And in, in the spirit of this conference, I'd like to just acknowledge how widespread these can be. Um, these are uh, the data from a poll we conducted in uh, Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay, so this is not nationally representative data, but these are uh, participants in a survey company called YouGov's online poll, and you can see very widespread endorsement of a number of myths and conspiracy theories related to the U.S. Uh, Jews in Israel. Okay, um, so belief in these kinds of misconceptions and conspiracy theories is widespread, right? Not just in the United States, but around the world, uh, and it can have. Um, you know, very pernicious consequences. So why do people believe these things to be true? Well, so there's two risk factors that I want to describe to you. First, this idea of selective exposure, that people uh, seek out information that seems to confirm their point of view. Okay? And this is often expressed as a, a fear of echo chambers, if you've ever heard that term, that people are trapped in uh, information flows that seem to just coincide with what they'd like to believe. And then the second is this risk of selective acceptance, that even when we get the right information in front of people, they may not choose to accept it. They may instead engage in what's called directionally motivated reasoning, where their preference for what they'd like to be true is overriding their ability to discern what is actually true. Okay? And again, these, extend, these problems extend beyond politics to health and all other sorts of controversial topics. Okay. So this echo chamber idea you've probably heard about is something, it's something that we're talking about a lot in the United States right now, and I imagine in other places as well. It turns out to be a, a bit of more of a nuanced problem. I want to share with you the best available data here from my co-author Andrew Guess at Princeton University. And what he finds using a, uh, a measure of how liberal or conservative given uh, websites are, um, this is actual behavioral data looking at the websites that people visit, and what he finds is that um, the average Democrat, the average Republican, and the average Independent have generally pretty centrist information diets in terms of the kinds of websites they go to. It doesn't seem that the average person is trapped in echo chambers. That's the graph that's appear, that appears on the left there, okay? with Republicans, as is conventional in the United States, denoted in red 
Democrats in blue, and the independents in gray. So the average person doesn't seem to be an echo chamber. Many people are tuned out. They're not paying very close attention to politics. Or if they are paying attention to politics, um, they have reasonably diverse information diets. But what happens when you move from that looking at the average person's information consumption diet to the overall political news audience, the story becomes much different. Okay, so you can see in that other panel there on the right that the overall news audience is much more polarized. Okay? It's much more polarized. Democrats are much more likely to visit websites like the New York Times, the Huffington Post, and the Daily Coast, whereas uh, Republicans are much more likely to visit websites like Fox News and Breitbart, if you've heard of those. Okay? So how can those both be true at the same time? Well, there's a, a small subset of people who consume a lot of political news. The people who follow politics most closely often have the strongest preferences. And so those folks are driving that intense polarization we see in the news audience, even though they're relatively rare in the overall population. Okay? Um, we've been studying this phenomenon in the context of, of, of so-called fake news. Okay? So referring specifically, that term has been used all sorts of ways, but I want to just be clear, referring specifically to um, those for-profit websites that popped up in the United States prior to the 2016 presidential election. These are the five most widely shared fake news stories in the United States in that period. They're all false. Okay? Pope Francis did not endorse Donald Trump. Uh, Hillary, Hillary Clinton did not sell weapons to ISIS. You can, um, you can read all of those. But these were shared millions and millions of times. In fact, the most shared fake news stories were shared more often on Facebook than the most shared mainstream news stories in the period before the 2016 election. Okay? So using the same kind of behavioral data I described to you earlier, my co-authors and I find uh, that about one in four Americans actually went to one of these fake news websites in the period before the 2016 election. Okay? They were heavily favor slanted towards favoring Donald Trump. And consistent with that, uh, with that finding, we see that consumption of these so-called fake news sites was, was overwhelmingly concentrated among those folks who supported Donald Trump. So again, remember the idea of selective exposure is that people are seeking out information that coincides with their point of view. That's exactly what we see with fake news. We see Trump supporters being especially likely to consume this form of content which overwhelmingly favors their preferred candidate and attacks a candidate they oppose, Hillary Clinton. Okay? You can see here that uh, more than 40% of Trump supporters actually visited one or more of these fake news sites compared to about 20% of Clinton supporters and it made up a much larger share of their overall news consumption diet online. Okay? But remember, I've told you that echo chambers aren't um, as prevalent as you might think. So what we're going to do now is disaggregate people in a little bit more of a fine-grained way. We're going to take people's overall information diets in the period before the 2016 election, and we're going to divide it up into different groups. We're going to divide it into 10 equally sized groups called deciles, and we're going to think from the 10% of Americans who have the most liberal information diets to the 10% who have the most conservative information diets. Okay? And what you're going to see is that this phenomenon is really concentrated among a very small set of people. So this is a measure of, did you visit one of these fake news sites or not? So it's a, it's a pure binary measure of whether you visited a pro-Trump or pro-Clinton fake news site in the period before the 2016 election. Again, we're moving from liberal at the first decile, the most liberal 10% of Americans in terms of their information diet, to the most conservative decile, the 10% of Americans with the most conservative information diets. And what you can see there, I hope, is how much different that 10% of Americans with the most conservative information diets looks than everybody else, right? Um, almost 75% of folks in that group visited one or more of these fake news sites before the election. No other group comes close. That picture is even more stark when we look at the total number of articles that people read on those sites. You can see that, again, that 10% of Americans with the most conservative information diets um, have a vastly disproportionate uh, number of the total visits to fake news sites. So this selective exposure phenomenon was really concentrated among this small set of Americans. About 60% of the total visits to fake news sites we observe came from this small group of people. Right? So on the one hand, that may be reassuring. That means that this problem isn't necessarily as widespread as you might fear. But on the other hand, that is a group you can imagine that's more politically active and knowledgeable, and therefore the political system may be especially likely to be responsive to those folks, even though they're relatively few in number. The second problem I'd like to talk to you about is what's called selective acceptance. Right? So even if it's the case that people are sometimes, to some extent, trying to find or, or preferring information that coincides with their point of view, there may be other cases where that corrective information that they need is, is being shown to them directly. And what I have here are two examples of that kind of approach. The first is the so-called uh, 
fact-checking model that's become quite prominent, not just in the United States, but now around the world in political journalism, where there are journalists in, in countries around the world who are uh, examining the accuracy of statements made by politicians and other political elites. Okay? And that's a way to try to provide uh, context to allow people to evaluate whether this claim that they might have just heard is true. Okay. On the right, we have a brochure about the flu vaccine um, that's, pr that's issued by the CDC, the main uh, public health agency in the United States, and it's trying to debunk various myths about the flu vaccine that might deter people from getting vaccinated and, and prevent them from being protected against what is actually a very serious public health problem. Okay. So the question that we don't know the answer to yet, though, is how effective these approaches really are. Okay. Um, and, and going back to, the, as you heard in the introduction, it's important to evaluate how effective these kinds of approaches are rather than just assuming that they work. We'd like to believe that they work, but of course that's an empirical question. And that's something that we're going to evaluate using randomized experiments. Okay. So let me start with the bad news. In some cases, uh, but certainly not all, in some cases we've actually found that corrective information fails to change people's minds, or actually can ma even make those misperceptions stronger among the people who are predisposed to reject the corrective information that we're giving them. So this is an example from the Bush administration from my own research, where we provide people with a mock news article and we randomize within it corrective information. Okay? That, the, the statement in the article was a statement by George W. Bush that was drawn from actual, an actual statement he made claiming that his tax cut would actually reduce the deficit and increase government revenues which is a claim that no economist believes, including those who served in his administration. So in that corrective information, then a, a random subset of people who viewed that article uh, received corrective information saying that actually um, his statement was very unlikely to be true. And then we looked at whether people endorsed the claim or not. And what we found was that among those conservatives who were predisposed to believe George W. Bush and to reject that corrective information, belief in the myth actually became higher. Okay. So that's a very worrisome finding, right? If we're giving people corrective information and they're actually coming to believe in the myth more strongly. Okay. Now, I don't want to suggest that that's the norm because there's been a lot more, more research since we conducted that study by myself and, and many other scholars as it's become a more important topic. And we are also we are finding some evidence that, in general, people move to some extent in the direction that corrective information suggests. So this is a, a graph from research I conducted during the 2016 campaign debunking the suggestion by Donald Trump that uh, crime rates were up in the United States. You may have heard this sort of claim. It was widely made in the period before the election. There was a, a small increase in crime in the year prior to the 2016 election, but that's in the context of a, a decades-long overall decline in violent crime. And we found that when we gave people corrective information explaining this long-term decline in violent crime, both supporters of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump moved towards being less likely to believe in the myth that crime was increasing over a longer time period. Okay. So what can you do? Okay, so this is maybe the most important question for everyone to be thinking about as you think about this in your own work and in the work of your partners. Okay. The first recommendation that I would offer to you is to avoid reinforcing the myths that you're trying to correct. Okay. This can seem very intuitive, but it's important, to be wor it's important to be concerned about how this kind of approach could be counterproductive. This is a brochure from the Centers for Disease Control trying to convince smokers to stop smoking. Okay? And it says, is, is what you know about smoking wrong? Right? Here are some new facts about smoking that might surprise you. Right? The problem with this brochure, as, I, as you may be thinking as you look at it, is that the things that are in bold that are the largest on here are the myths, not the facts. Right? So it may be the case that people simply read the myth part, which is actually reinforcing some false belief you might like to debunk, and they may actually forget the reasons why it isn't true. There's some research on this so-called illusion of truth effect that f claims that feel familiar to us we're more likely to infer are, are true. So over time, even if we at, at first believe that the claim is false, over time our, our, that, our knowledge of that correction, our, our, our uh, ability to recognize that this is a false claim may leave our memory and we may simply know we've heard that claim before and it seems like there might be something there that's important. Okay, so um, featuring myths, highlighting them can be, a very, uh, uh, can be a very risky strategy. The second approach I would recommend is to, use, to think about ways to prevent corrective information in formats that are more compelling. Right? This is an example from my research looking at uh, how to 
overcome the widespread misperception uh, that climate change isn't taking place in the United States. And so what we did is we randomized people to receive either this graph you see on the left, which shows the overall trend towards increased global temperatures from four independent data sources, or to, to receive equivalent textual information uh, from a press release that accompanied that same graph. So it's describing the same information in two different ways, either in textual form or in graphical form. And the idea was that that graphical form, format might be more compelling or harder to counter-argue. Right? The, the extent to which those four independent data sources mirror each other so closely really suggests there's something going on here. Right? Um, because one of the strategies that people have used in climate change denial is to try to raise questions about the data. But you can see that these four independent data sources are showing the exact same trend. Right? And when we did test that rigorously in the context of a randomized experiment, we found that graphical approach was more effective. Okay, so this, the results that you see on the right there are the predicted probabilities that people would reject the scientific consensus that global warming was occurring. Right? In other words, they would indicate that temperatures were actually staying the same or becoming cooler. Okay? And that was among self-identified Republicans, the group in the United States that's most likely to deny the existence of climate change, you can see that that graphical information was even more effective than equivalent textual information at reducing climate change denial. So we think that's an encouraging finding and one that suggests uh, you know, the value of, of, of alternative approaches for co presenting corrective information. A third recommendation that I'd like to offer you is to think about what sources might be most credible to your audience. Okay? I think one of the problems with communication in this area is we often simply assume the facts are enough. But what, in, in a lot of cases, what matters is whether people trust the source of those facts. Right? And in a lot of cases, the reason that the myth has become so widespread is that the people who typically present the factual information that you're trying to deliver are not widely trusted by the people who aren't listening to it. Right? So what I have here are two examples of how you might approach those kinds of problems more effectively. Uh, on the left is data from a survey of parents in the United States asking them, who do you most trust to get information about vaccines? Okay? And they overwhelmingly say their child's doctor. Not scientists, not the government, not celebrities, their child's doctor. That's a person who is in a position of trust. That between, for those of you who have children, of course, um, that's a very personal kind of relationship and in the earliest years of your child's life, you see that pediatrician a lot, right? And you build a relationship with them. That's someone who could have a conversation with you and who you might trust in a different way than something you read on the internet. Okay, so leveraging those kinds of trust relationships is going to be critical to combating vaccine hesitancy. And that may mean helping doctors have those conversations in more effective ways. Uh, and that's something that researchers are just starting to work on, but I think it's more likely to be effective than just simply dropping more scientific information from the top down. There's a similar kind of example on the right during the debate over that provision I mentioned to you earlier, um, the supposed provision of the Affordable Care Act I mentioned to you earlier, the, the, the death panels myth. And this is one of my favorite articles responding to that myth and, and, and describing it in a way that people might find credible who would be otherwise inclined to believe the death panel myth is true. So you can see and highlighted in red there, so that the, the headline is experts debunk healthcare reform bills death panel rule. So right there they're already saying experts, right? They're not saying Democrats, right? Which would not be a credible source to those folks who are inclined to um, oppose President Obama's proposal. But what's most important is what's highlighted in red there at the bottom. It says, healthcare experts, even those who do not support the version of the healthcare reform bill now being discussed, note that these accusations are shocking, inflammatory, and incorrect. Right? So these are people who are speaking against their political interests. They do not support President, they did not support President Obama's healthcare bill at the time. And even they said that the death panel myth was a fraud, was a fiction. Right? So that's an example of how more credible sourcing can play a very important role in, in, in reaching people who might otherwise be skeptical. Okay. This is one of my favorite examples. This is a, actually a political scientist, so a member of my tribe named Katie Atwell, um, who lives in Western Australia. Okay. She, she uh, lived in a kind of hi what they would describe as a kind of hippie community where alternative lifestyles were common. And that was a, a community where vaccination rates were very low. People were very suspicious of mainstream medicine. And 
one of the big challenges there is that people's values and identities in terms of how they related to the world and how the kinds of lifestyles that they like to practice were seen as being in conflict with vaccinating their children. And that was putting not just their children at risk, but Katie's children at risk. And she decided to think about how to communicate more effectively why people in that community should vaccinate their children. And so she designed this advertising campaign um, that was intended to signal the shared value, the identities and values that, that, that she shared with members of that community. And it provided a set of exemplars to say, we're people who share your values and we vaccinate, right? So just like there's, there are uh, expert sources who might be more credible, this is the kind of signaling that I'm a member of your community, of your culture, of your group, and, he, and I'm practicing this behavior that I don't see as being in conflict with the values and identities that we, that we share. So here she says, um, she's a mom of two, a Kubi local, which is a, a, a town there. I home birth, I use cloth nappies, which is what they call diapers in Australia, and I immunize, right? And there's a whole series of these. There's one with a dad holding his, his, his child in a hemp baby carrier. You know, they're, they're, they're intended to signal that there doesn't have to be a conflict between the values and identities that you hold and the way you take care of your child's health. Right? And that's going to be a really powerful sort of idea, because in a lot of cases where these myths start or come from is when our po politics and our values and our identity start getting wrapped up in factual questions. And we often have one of the most effective ways to deal with that is to prevent that entangling from taking place. Now, that's, of course, easier said than done, but it is possible. Right? If you think about what happened in the United States with climate change, it's a, it's a historically unusual pattern. Conservative parties around the world recognize the existence of climate change. The Republican Party is a real outlier. And it's important to think about what we got wrong. Okay? And to think about going forward, how to prevent that same kind of entangling from taking place on issues of concern to you and your grantees. Let me give you an example from the other side of the political spectrum. Genetically modified foods. Okay? Genetically modified foods have been rated as safe by every major scientific organization. That doesn't mean there's not a legitimate debate to be had about the policies we might have around them. But that basic scientific fact is one that is a strong scientific consensus and, as well. And yet, genetically modified foods are starting to become entangled with liberal politics in the United States and Europe. Okay? And that has the potential to undermine the very real gains that could be achieved using genetically modified foods to help feed the world, right? to help feed the people who have less. Okay? So I know a scientist at Dartmouth College where I teach who is self-identifies as a liberal and is very concerned that the backlash against genetically modified foods will prevent him from helping make sure that these advances can be leveraged for the benefit of, of humanity. Okay, so um, it's, it's very important to avoid this kind of conflict uh, from becoming entangled in, uh, in whatever issue you might be concerned with. So let me just sum up some important takeaways that I hope are useful to you in thinking about this overall problem. The first is, I want to suggest to you that there aren't any magic messages, okay? So the typical response that I often hear is, well, we just haven't figured out how to present these, the facts in the right way. I'm not sure that there's any such message out there. At least, I've never seen it. I once read a letter to the editor from a doctor about the vaccine problem who said, we're one brochure away from solving the vaccine hesitancy problem in this country. I don't think there is such a brochure. I would encourage you to keep trying. If, you, if, you, if your grantees have such a brochure, please send it to me. Um, but I don't think it exists. Okay? And so what that means is um, we have to be realistic about the effectiveness of messaging in general. And we have to attend to context in a really important way. What messages work in one context may be wholly irrelevant to another. Okay? So if you're thinking about vaccine hesitancy, for instance, in the United States, what works among... Um, white affluent liberals in the San Francisco Bay Area is going to be completely different than what works in the Amish community in Ohio. And that's going to be completely different from what works in the Orthodox community in New York City. And that's going to be completely different from what works with the Somali American community outside Minneapolis, which just had a major measles outbreak. There is no one message that's going to work directly across all those contexts. And it's going to be very important to partner with people who have that knowledge about what works in a given community. The second best practice that I would offer to you is that it's essential to act before myths become widespread. Once these myths become widespread, it is very difficult to get rid of them. Okay? Let me give you an example of this. We talked a little bit about the birther myth earlier. That has become so entrenched in the United States. Uh, my, uh, one of my former colleagues and I did a poll after Barack Obama took office and belief in the birther myth had actually gone up. 
We thought maybe once he wasn't the president, people's politics would kind of be set aside and they could say, okay, fine, he actually was born in the United States. It's not true. Okay? So these myths are incredibly difficult to debunk once they're established. Barack Obama, again, released his long-form birth certificate, the most definitive evidence you could possibly have, and belief in the birth myth went down for about three weeks. Okay? And then it just bounced right back to where it was. Okay? So it's going to be essential to act early to stop these myths before they become entrenched and to avoid that kind of controversy and value conflict that helps these myths take off. Okay. Finally, I would really encourage you to think more broadly about how to communicate rather than simply direct to the public. Okay. One of the things that I emphasize the most to people is that direct to the public communication is really difficult. Most people won't hear you and those who do often have the strongest prior beliefs, just like we were talking about earlier. And so what that means is it may be better to work through trusted intermediaries of various kinds. And again, that's going to differ depending on the context, depending on the question you're interested in. But it could be pediatricians in the case of vaccines. It could be um, senior you know, uh, leaders within a given community who can help broker the kinds of conversations that wouldn't work without some intermediary vouching for you in that context. Right? But those kinds of intermediaries often are going to be more powerful in communicating than uh, simply hearing it from someone who doesn't have that same position of trust, who isn't a part of that same community. Okay. So finally, let me just, let me just conclude with what I, what I hope you all can do, or at least can think about doing in your research, in your funding rather, and that is to think about how to support research in the context of your existing grant making. Encourage your grantees to partner with academics to conduct randomized controlled trials when possible to evaluate the effectiveness of the strategies they're using. Okay. That may, in the context of misperceptions, that may help us to learn more about what works, to catch, catch these misconceptions before they take off, um, and uh, to learn in a more rigorous way uh, how to accomplish whatever the goals are of your program. Um, it can be scary to run randomized controlled trials. We're often wrong, but you can learn from that. It's important to celebrate those kinds of failures, even if they're painful at the time, because you can adjust your strategies and approaches as a result. Without that kind of hard data, it's very difficult, it's very difficult to, uh, to know whether what we do works. And there are whole areas of medicine, health, journalism, politics, and education where we know very little about what works. Randomized controlled trials aren't the only way to evaluate a program. Of course, you've all used different strategies, but it's one of the most powerful ones. And I would suggest to you it's often easier than you think to, to accomplish. So let me just say, finally, um, thank you so much again for this opportunity. I hope this was useful to you. If there's anything I can do to help you with your own work, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks very much. So thank you very much, Professor Nyhan, for that very illuminating and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, it may be self-evident to some, it may not be self-evident to others, but obviously this relates back to our own work uh, as philanthropists and funders. Uh, at some point, especially if we've been doing something for several years and we're very emotionally attached, we're bound to be victims of what Professor Nyhan coined as the backfire effect in our own work. We're bound to see multiple data points uh, that show that our approaches may not be working and then look for ways to reinforce our own ideas and maybe even say, maybe the research wasn't good, maybe the information isn't correct. Uh, we tend to throw good money after bad because we're not so keen on revising our own basic ideas and assumptions. Plus, no one wants to think that they've spent the last 10 years investing millions of dollars in the wrong thing. It's just something very difficult to accept, but we can all benefit from being able to do so. So eight years ago when I decided that I was going to become a full-time philanthropist, I closed my business and I decided what I felt most strongly about was this huge gap between perception and reality when it comes to Israel. How come I could have grown up in Hampstead Garden suburb in London, my husband could have stayed in Long Beach where he grew up, 
Why did we choose to live here? Because we think Israel's an amazing place. Surely there must be a reason that nobody else is seeing what we're seeing. And I couldn't understand it. So I decided, right, I'm going to put all my effort and all my energy into the field of Israel advocacy. That's what you do when you want to improve Israel's image, right? I thought because I'm blonde and I've got this English accent, maybe if I speak on CNN on behalf of Israel's policies, people will listen, uh, and so on and so forth. But because I came from a very fresh perspective, and I really didn't have any particular opinion in this regard, first I thought, let's look at the data. Let's see if it's working. And over time, if you look at it, improvement in Israel's image based on how much money is being put into it and how many amazing organizations there are, the improvement should have been much, much greater. And so I thought, wait a minute, just a minute. I want to think about what I'm going to do. First of all, I personally don't feel the need to represent the Israeli government. I'm not here because of the Israeli government policies. I'm here because I love this place and I think it's got an amazing story to tell. And so when I looked at it that way, I thought there must be another way of engaging people in a positive way about Israel. And so I decided to seek other ways of doing it and I came across a completely different way of approaching the exact same thing, which is trying to improve Israel's uh, image. Uh, and I do that today through my nonprofit, Vibe Israel. And it's very interesting. I feel like I took a crash course in Professor Nyhan's uh, uh, information that he has to share because most of the stuff that you're talking about, we're doing in terms of bringing a different message to a different kind of audience and engaging with, for example, uh, online opinion leaders who are not Israeli, who are not Jewish, who are giving third-party endorsement of Israel. And it works. It works really well. So this is something that I feel that I want to make sure that I keep with me as I go along. I'm sure that within the next few years, I am personally am going to be a victim of my own uh, issues with backfire effect, and I want to make sure that I constantly look at the research in a very, very open and um, willing to challenge way. And this is something that I hope that we all walk away with today. Uh, if you heard uh, Andres' uh, remarks in the first plenary, he gave us five recommendations of what to do. I think the third one was about curiosity, and you talked about deja vu and vuja day. If anybody remembers that, I think we all, all kind of said, well, that's interesting. Let's take something that's very familiar and see it in a completely different way. I think this is what the backfire effect is all about. It's alive and kicking, and I think we can all benefit from recognizing that it's there, looking at it, and by the way, one of the great things about Israel and one of the things that we share about Israel is this ability and willingness to embrace failure. Failure is a good thing as long as you learn from it, and the only way we can know if we're failing is if we check ourselves constantly. So I hope we all walk away with some lessons from this very interesting talk. Thank you very much.